want to say I appreciate you, Dan, for coming on this episode for a second week in a row. I know we had a lot of takes and a lot of storylines heading into this uh, divisional round weekend for the NFL. How have you been? How's your week been going? Anything new with you going on? Oh, man, it's just uh, great to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be a guest. Uh, caught those games, man, and uh, took some notes. So I'm just I'm ready to dive in today. You know, we'll go ahead and dive in. The first game of the week saw the, the Baltimore Ravens and the Houston Texans. And I think it was a game that a lot of people believe the Ravens should have won in the fashion that they did. But I'd be lying to you if I said there wasn't a part of me that honestly thought that C.J. Stroud and the Texans were going to somehow pull off like an upset. But um, heading into it, how did you feel about the Texans' chance against Lamar Jackson and the Ravens? Listen, all fairy tales have have to come to an end, whether that be a happy ending or a bad ending. I think this is a great experience for C.J. Stroud. And what I what I mean by that is him losing prepares him for the future. You could always learn a lot from losing. Um, and it definitely wasn't his year. There was no way that a rookie was going to be able to beat a veteran, a seasoned veteran at that, having an MVP season with finally a good team on both ends. Um, I think the Texans had a good run. I think, you know, this, this shows that, okay, they have the chance to be contenders with a good leader. That's what this game highlighted most, was that the Texans got there. I wasn't, in my mind, I didn't think they were going to stand a chance. But the fact that they made it that far was a testament to his skill. And I think he'll be a great quarterback for years to come. Um, Not everyone has the Brady story where they can just step in and win. I think we expect that now in football after seeing guys like, you know, your Brady's or the backup stories like Nick Foles. Like, that's just not going to happen. You know, it's not a, a rare occurrence. We know Brady by his name because he's Brady, not because there's a million of them. So I really thought, you know, and I think C.J. Stroud is a great quarterback. He's shown he has great arm maturity, and what I mean by that is he's not throwing too many picks. He's only making the reads that he can make. He makes beautiful throws. He's accurate, mobile. He can do it all. He has a good pocket presence, but I just didn't think they were going to stand a chance against, you know, the the reigning, who we all know is going to be an MVP. He's in his prime, and his team is, like I said, finally good on both ends. You know, and I'm glad you brought up a point about Lamar Jackson. I I have a quick take on C.J. Stroud. I know we talked about him off air and, and, you know, throughout the week. I think just in the previous week and during Wild Card Week, and he just seemed so poised. You know, you would have never guessed that he was a rookie. Coming out of the draft, obviously everyone was hyping up Bryce Young, and he was supposed to be touted as the next big thing. And granted, maybe it's because of the scenario and the environment that Bryce Young is currently in, because as we know, Carolina Panthers are not, you know, an organization that's really on the come up. I think C.J. Stroud is definitely in a better scenario, a better environment, especially with a young defensive-minded coach like D'Amico Ryan, who came out of the Kyle Shanahan coaching tree, where they pride themselves in establishing the run and a dominant defense, which can only fare well for a young quarterback like a C.J. Stroud. I think, like you said, he has that arm maturity, but he also has that mental toughness that I think will help him throughout the course of his career. And if this is what he's showing us in his first season, let alone bringing the Houston Texans to the postseason, actually winning the division in his first you know, season as a starter, I think that's impressive as it is, especially given how they were supposed to be in a rebuilding year after losing, or not even losing, but trading away Deshaun Watson and kind of getting fleeced for all these draft picks, which in hindsight, I think the Houston Texans won that trade. As you can see, Deshaun Watson didn't even complete his year with the Cleveland Browns. I think, yeah. I think as you mentioned, <laughs> C.J. Stroud, well, I mean, because it's like, in hindsight, yeah, you can say like it didn't work out for him, but in the moment, yeah, everyone was touting the Cleveland Browns as a serious threat. Now, granted, they made the playoffs, but with Joe Flacco, I mean, you saw how that turned out. They're, you know, they didn't they didn't even show off the bus. They didn't even come off the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and with that being said, like you said, they made it to the playoffs after being, you know, a drought stricken team for success. I mean, they have been historically asked, let's be real. Texans have been historically asked. They've had mm-hmm. some standout players, but no one has thought in recent years, I'm talking even with prime J.J. Watt, mm-hmm. nobody's thinking this team is going to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, the fact that he's even able to get them this 
you know, have a winning season as a rookie to an organization that's not good. Um, and I can't even say that anymore because they showed that obviously they made the right picks this year and last year to put him in this position. Um, going back to Bryce Young's, I, I don't believe that there are some organizations in sports that no matter who they get, they're just not going to get it done. You could have the best player and still not win anything. And that's just, to me, reflects more on the organization and less on the player. I do think he's going to be a great quarterback. I just think he's not in the right – he's not at the right team. Like, Ben Roethlisberger had to go to the Steelers. You know what I mean? It, you have to you have to be on the right team. You're not going to win with certain people. Drew Brees had to go to the Saints. You're not going to win mm-hmm. with certain organizations simply because that organization doesn't have what it takes, whether that be in the front office, whether that be on the, you know, the coaching staff, or, you know, or players. It's just – it's not going to happen at some organizations. Because when you think about it, I mean – how many teams have won? How, how do you know how many teams have won Super Bowls in the NFL? I'm not too sure. Um, well, I know for a fact four of them haven't. So I want to say at least you know over 25 off the top of my head because I know like Jacksonville, the Texans, they haven't. The Cardinals haven't for sure because they haven't accomplished anything in the last 100 years. <laughs> and I I I, des- I desperately hope that everybody like at work who's a Cardinal fan or claims to be a Cardinal fan knows that. That they're the oldest team in the NFL and they have nothing to show for it. <laughs> that is crazy. Now I'm looking at this. It says twenty teams have won a Super Bowl. Okay. Um, and fifteen hold multiple titles. So just to put that in perspective, if the if the football has been around for a hundred years and only fifteen teams have repeated, that means the other seventeen, you know, will never win again basically is what I'm saying is this it's only a select organizations you got your you know teams like uh the 49ers who have dominated eras and generations you got teams like the Steelers who have dominated you got teams like you know you could throw the Ravens in there that have multiple championships sure, sure. um Cowboys obviously big one yeah but I, I mean you just are not expecting the Panthers to get anything done and I, I'm pretty sure the Panthers are one of those teams who haven't won so, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not expecting Bryce Young to really do much uh, until he leaves. Yeah, and I think what it really comes down to is developing that culture because, like you mentioned, the teams like the Steelers, like the Niners, like the Cowboys, they weren't always perennial winners, but over time they had to develop that culture and that championship mentality that would mold them into what they are now. Now they have that expectation of championships, but I guarantee you back in 1981 – when the Niners were, you know, having Bill Walsh as a third-year head coach, uh, Joe Montana as a third-year quarterback, they didn't have anything to go off of. They didn't have that expectation. They were building it as they go. So that's what I see with Houston. I see this as their opportunity to develop a culture under D'Amico Ryans and change the fortune of their organization. And the same could be said with Carolina. They just haven't found the right pieces. I'm not saying Bryce Young is going to be the next Joe Montana, but who's who's who are we to say that maybe he's not that quarterback to help change their ways? It was his rookie year, and as we know, Peyton Manning was a rookie, and he had the record for most interceptions as a rookie. So you can't judge him by that first year. This is the baseline. This is what we're working with. But I do agree with your take that it has a lot to do with the organization and how they're able to form coaching, how they're able to form a play style, and again, most importantly, the culture that they're setting in terms of their expectations moving forward. For sure. And I mean, if they couldn't get it done with MVP cam, that says a lot Um, because I believe cam is what Josh Allen is. I mean, prime cam, you know, is shown that he has the same abilities that we, we hold Josh Allen in, in a high regards. Prime cam was that guy and they couldn't get it done. Having the best regular season record that year. Um, I think it definitely reflects the the organization and definitely how they dealt with him after that. You know, it feels like after that they kind of gave up on him. And unfortunately, which I think also adds to, you know, like we said, the, the organization's makeup and their the, the way they treat their players. Um, so I'm just hoping Bryce Young has a great career. And like you said, it's his rookie year. But, yes, I, I don't believe – he will be, as far as like Super Bowls, I don't think he wins a ring with the Panthers. It just, I, I just don't see that. 
Yeah, no, I don't think you're you're wrong for thinking that, especially given the the current state of that franchise. But you did talk about Josh Allen, and I want to stay in, inside the the AFC. Um, what is your take on Josh Allen's performance against the Kansas City Chiefs? Because heading into this game, he is 0-2 against the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs. Now, granted, those first two games were in Arrowhead in Kansas City. This was his first opportunity to host the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs and finally get over the hump. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. What, what do you think Josh Allen's mindset or the organization itself's mindset is knowing that they still weren't able to defeat the Kansas City Chiefs? Listen, man, I think people have to cut Josh Allen some slack. I mean, i seen the memes flood in immediately. But listen, Josh Allen is a guy that went out there and he kept them in the game. At one point, had to leave. So, I mean, yes, he's at home. And we're talking about different weathers here. But Kansas City is not a hot place. So it's like, I mean, they're both going to get frigid temperatures. They're both going to see, you know, large crowds. At the end of the day, I feel like we're depending on the weather too much. Um, where as, as fans, these are professionals. They've played in every weather because they were in college, meaning they had to go to different states and conferences and all different types of weather. So they've done it all. There's no excuse whether it was snowing, raining, hail, shit, if the field was on fire. So um, I believe that, yes, he had the home field advantage. He technically had the weather advantage. That really wasn't an advantage because when you're going against a Hall of Famer, you know, the outside noise doesn't matter. What happens and what matters is is, is what happens on between those lines on the field. So I think he had an, an exceptional game. A lot of people will fault him for the last play, not throwing it to, to Diggs. But, I mean, look at Diggs the entire game. That nigga was dropping passes. He dropped a simple over the shoulder. I mean, jumped into it, which is like, I mean, when I was playing flag football at third grade, you know, the coach tells you not to jump into balls unless you have to, you know, pause. Mm. He's, he, this dude jumped into it for no reason and then dropped it. So, I mean, he was, was getting locked up pretty much the whole game. He was being doubled. Um, they had a specific guy, I think it was the safety, was watching him from afar. So, he would run a route, maybe he does a slant, quick slant, he gets away from his corner. There's a safety hovering over him because let's let's be real Diggs is the real offensive weapon that josh allen can throw the the most um known and highly touted weapon that he has yeah. so i mean you're gonna expect that that's the guy that's gonna be targeted so i think he he did what he you know should because the guy in the end zone was also open as well he just gonna make the throw how he wanted to and that happens um it's it, it was unfortunate the way the game ended i do believe there's other um decisions that led to them losing but josh allen played exceptional i mean i think you know he showed he showed off that mobility his size the grit because he was taking some some mean hits um this bro i've never seen that many lateral passes in a game before i mean he had about two or three um and was just able to go in there on aggressive mode how would you rate his performance? You know, I w I'm really glad you brought up his his aggressiveness in the game because, like you mentioned, there was there was quite a few lateral plays. It looked like he was trying to take a playbook out of Patrick Mahomes because there were times where he was throwing a little bit of a side throw and again, kind of playing trickery with his with his game and trying to keep them on their toes, which I think is a smart thing to do, especially against this year's Kansas City Chiefs, who have prided themselves in a defense. Throughout the regular season, they kind of struggled offensively. A lot of that had to do with their receivers dropping balls and realizing and you and i talked about this heading into the game the key for buffalo was to control the tempo and to control the clock to keep mahomes and that offense off the field and i thought they did a pretty good job at that the only thing that that they kind of struggled with like you mentioned was the receivers like Diggs not really performing i believe i think i, I might be wrong i believe he had three or four receptions for the game and going back to that last throw where you were saying how he didn't throw it underneath to, to, to Diggs, because this is something I brought up as well. I personally felt, of course, if he hits that, that deep pass for the touchdown, all this is erased, and you know we're not talking about them losing. But if I'm in that position, I don't know if you're trying to be overly aggressive because they were coming out of the two-minute warning, and you want to score right off the bat, giving Kansas City two minutes with that ball. 
I think the better read was to dish it out to Diggs because he can go underneath, you can keep the clock running. Again, you're still working at your own pace, and if you're not able to score that touchdown, you can settle for the field goal, go to overtime. Because if you give that touchdown right there at two minutes, because they were coming out of the two-minute warning, you're giving Patrick Mahomes two minutes to score and essentially put the game away. I think, again, in the hindsight, being 2020, that's where you go. And like you said, Diggs was dropping passes. But if he drops the pass, what would they have been? They would have, it would have been like fourth and five, I believe it was, right? Yeah. Some, something around there. They settled for the field goal. Or, like you and I mentioned, it's only five yards. In the first quarter, they were going for it on fourth down. What stopped them from going for it right then and there in that play? I, I'm a fan of, of their coach, Sean McDermott. I do think they, like you mentioned earlier when we, were, when we spoke on the phone, some of their play calling was a little bit unbalanced, and it didn't really make sense. In the first half, you're going for it, and you're being aggressive, and now in the fourth quarter, you're taking your foot off the gas. And, and you saw what happened with Vass. He, he, you know, shanked the kick, and you did mention that. I will give you credit for that, Dan. Off, <laughs> off, of, the, off of some of his kicks, it seemed uneven. We weren't comfortable with seeing how he was kicking, and it came down to that. They had an opportunity to tie it for half for uh, for overtime, and that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. And and it, and it's funny that we, uh, you know, like you said, if he throws it to to digs and he drops it they still got that fourth and five but they're still going to go for that field goal and miss at this point i'm not trying to tie with kansas city because it's clear that they're not confident with their the ability of stopping Mahomes, which is why literally the very first drive i mean the very first drive we'll say they go for it on fourth down did you i don't know if you realize that yeah on the very first set of downs they went for it mm-hmm. it's clear that they're not comfortable with the ball in Mahomes hand. But that being said, I the longer this game lasts, it plays to our disadvantage if I'm the coach of the Bills. I know we can't stop Mahomes. So let's get points on the board because tying it was not going to help us because it's a it's a 100% chance he's going to score. It's not a 100% chance that we score. Um now what does that say about the coach's faith in um Josh Allen? Who knows. But they were going for it on everything. Which said to me, he's not comfortable with the defense, and he's not comfortable with this being a game of quarterbacks. He wants to put this game away. That was a very uh, aggressive throw by Josh Allen. Maybe Diggs was intended to be that receiver, um, which I guess we'll never know. But I do believe that, you know, let's say they kick the field goal and make it, it doesn't play into their favor. Because, like you said, Mahomes gets the ball back, even if there's 30 seconds. He's got the best, one of the best tight ends in the game, one of the best running backs in the game. I mean, they were just, it was obvious they were marching down the field and getting it done. Um, One thing that I seen, and I I was actually explaining it to my girlfriend, was, you know, she was asking me, well, why does it seem like Buffalo's on the field so long? Well, that's because it took them a lot of plays to get down there. A lot of, a lot of breaks with, you know, penalties and stuff that allowed them to advance Whereas the Chiefs felt like they didn't have the ball at all because as soon as they got it, they just marched straight down the field. So, I mean, whether it was 30 seconds or 50 seconds on the clock, Mahomes is a two-time Super Bowl champ. Let's just let's pay him the respect. Me and you both are not huge Mahomes fans, but the respect of his skill and his resume shows that it doesn't matter how much time is on the clock, he's still going to score. So, I mean... Obviously, you want him to have as little much time to work with, but I don't think the field goal was the way to go here. And then, play, like you said, it you hit, hit it right on the nail. Why were those niggas going for fake punts? <laughs> but then on fourth and five, they kick a field goal in the last, which would probably be the last possession of the game. Mm. It didn't make sense to me, um, especially with the kicker almost missing point after attempts. I mean, that's the easiest go-ahead point ever. Now, I heard the commentator saying there was, like, uh, opposing winds of, like, 15 miles per hour, which could affect kicks. But it looked like the Chiefs kicker was very comfortable. Now, he did get his kick blocked, but not necessarily the accuracy of his kicks. Those They were all straight down the middle. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was it was very inconsistent play calling. I mean, I felt like he was very aggressive, 
went in the very beginning and then at the end he kind of like you said let his foot off the gas they didn't go to the run game as much as i would like them to do because Mm -hmm. as you know mobile quarterbacks eat off of play action you're not selling the play action if you don't run the ball so i mean i think they should have ran the ball a little more got some rotations in there um and a lot more qb sneaks i mean if he could take hits in the first quarter the game on the line he should really be able to take hits so it was it was very interesting to see the the play calling towards the end um and definitely it would be it would be uh it'd be very interesting to see if the if that play was intended to go to digs because as you know these plays have intended receivers and okay this is supposed to be your first read so who knows maybe digs was supposed to be that you know intended option and so at that point, this falls on Josh Allen that he threw it to him. But I do believe, you know, it looked like his first look was to go for the end zone. I don't know. When he dropped back, you know, he kind of surveyed the field, but it looked like his he already had an idea of where he was going. So, I mean, to me that says, okay, this was intended to be like a scoring play. Um, but that's just my take on it. How did you? How do you feel about Mahomes? I mean – you know he does he does it again, pulls it off. That makes him three and zero with Josh Allen, correct? Yep, three and zero in the postseason. And you know, like you mentioned about Mahomes, we're not the biggest fans of Mahomes. Me for my own personal reasons, being Super Bowl fifty four. But <laughs> g- given that, and since what we've seen since Super Bowl fifty four, it's like you said, you have to give him his level of respect. And going back to Josh Allen's decision to throw the ball deep for a touchdown. If it was the read, or if it wasn't the read, whatever the case may be, he saw an opportunity and he took it. I will not fault him for that. But I go back to time management. And I personally felt, as as a, you know, a Mahomes hater, I felt like if you score then and you give him two minutes, that is a level of disservice and disrespect to Mahomes. Because now you're basically daring him to, to go on a game-winning drive, which we've seen him done. And I think ultimately, that last quarter... Because it was a great game. I thought, you know, the back and forth, the lead changes, a lot of, you know, near turnovers were occurring. You saw them fumbling the ball, recovering the ball on the very first drive. Um, they had, you know, fumbled the ball and batted out of out of bounds. Like, this was a game that was as competitive as it can be. But, as I mentioned, that fourth quarter came down to experience. Andy Reid, Mahomes, Kelsey, they've been here before. They play like they've been here before. And now they're on you know, their way to a six-straight AFC title game. I like the Bills. I'm a fan of Allen. And as I mentioned, I'm a fan of their coach, McDermott. But it comes down to experience. These guys, the, the Chiefs, the Chiefs know what to expect. They know what it takes to win a title. They've done it twice. They've been to the Super Bowl three times. The Bills haven't done so since the early 90s, 1993, when they lost four straight. And it goes back to that culture. Andy Reid knows how to win. I'm not a fan of the Chiefs, but I can trust his coaching style and what he expects his team to execute. I think the Bills had an excellent opportunity. I feel like based off of their three games overall that they've played in the playoffs, this was that opportunity to finally get the monkey off their back and get rid of the Chiefs. Unfortunately for them, they weren't able to do so. They played into the Chiefs' hands, and the Chiefs emerged victorious, and now they will be traveling to Baltimore to face them in the AFC Championships. And I talk about, you know, one of the best games of the weekend. I I do believe the Bills and Chiefs had that. But I want to go over to the NFC. And I would like to talk about probably the most stressful game that I have ever seen as a San Francisco (laughs) fan. Because that game in itself, and you saw the text I was sending you, I felt every emotion in my body. Disappointment, anger, frustration, happiness. (laughs) Happy, happiness, you know, uh, euphoria. Like uh, there were so many emotions in that game, and and and, and again, just it's just speaking as a San Francisco fan, I'm I'm 25 years of old, Dan. So, I've been around the block. I've I've seen this team for a good portion of my life. I grew up a Niner fan. My my father's the one that grew up a Niner fan and instilled that in my brother, my sister, my mother, myself, and to see the way they they performed in that game against Green Bay was was egregious. Brock Purdy, <laughs> I, I love Brock Purdy. I support Brock Purdy. I think he's a step up from, from, from Jimmy Garoppolo. I think given what happened with Trey Lance, this was our best case scenario. He understands the offense. 
He's the prototypical quarterback that Kyle would like in his offense. But I can officially say, you know, here, we don't play good in the rain. There were certain passes he would receive the ball from from the snap. And you see him wiping his hand because of, of how wet it was. And again, that's not no fault of his own. It's just the weather. But, Dan, you saw some of those passes were incomplete. They were off. And I'm going to fault that to the rain. I'm not going to fault that on Purdy. I'm going to fault that to the rain. But, but give me your take. You know, as unbiased because you didn't have a dog in the fight. Me, obviously, I'm biased towards the Niners. What is your take on the performance of Brock Purdy and the Niners against the Green Bay Packers in, in, in that game? Listen, so it was. I was feeling those emotions as well because although I didn't have a dog, you know, in the fight, I definitely picked the 49ers to win. So when I saw that it wasn't going that route, I was beginning to get upset. You know, you got people who say Brock Purdy is the real MVP. Now, when people say the real MVP, that means he's better than his own, to me, the real MVP of his own team, Christian McCaffrey. Um, And he didn't play like an MVP. Uh, For those who don't know, Cowboys fan here, he played like an NFC deck where he did just enough to win. Just like the first half was ugly. Now, actually, it's a disrespect to Brock to say he played like Dak. He played slightly better than what Dak would play in a good game. Thank you. He he did he did just enough to win, but that first half, I mean, McCaffrey on the sideline, he's hitting them in his toes. Like <laughs> it was it was not pretty. Both ends, both ends was getting were getting torched. I saw a lot of um, a lot of reckless playing. Um, man, I saw Trent Williams get flustered, lose his cool. The guy kind of sold the call, and then the rest is history. They could have really, the 49ers could have really taken themselves out of this game. And, I mean, at one point they did. Um, Jordan Love shocked me. Um, I did not expect this from him. I know that these young quarterbacks have been going on runs in the playoffs. And, you know, it's like that time where the Texans play the Ravens and you're like, okay, it's about time that you you have your exit here. It's been real. It's been nice. You got your experience. The MVP is going to take care of you, right? Mm-hmm. Which is what I expect the 49ers to do at this point. In my mind, the 49ers are sweeping every team except for the Eagles. You know, which obviously we know doesn't happen because the Eagles get bounced by Baker Mayfield. Walk it like I talk it. <laughs> and, but, you know, I'm expecting the 49ers to just basically walk every team down. Because if you talk about weapons, just weapons alone on both ends, it's unmatched. We haven't seen a team this stacked like this for a while. I mean, this is one of the best teams I've witnessed in my life. So I, I'm expecting them to go, just go out there and, and impose their will. Right off the back, it didn't happen. I think one big flaw I saw in the 49ers was special teams. Nice. I mean, the Packers put it on you guys. <laughs> Dude, it was, it was interesting to see that, you know, a team that wasn't supposed to be here was doing this. Now, rain or not, I mean, I feel like it rains more in San Francisco than it does Wisconsin. Because Wisconsin is a snow place. I don't have the stats on that. I'm not a meteorologist. But um, San Francisco is a cloudy place. Uh, it gets cloudy. It gets, you know, it's that the morning dew beach. You know, I just don't see it raining more in Wisconsin in the Midwest than, you know, on the Pacific West. So I don't know. I don't know about the weather. Like I said, I always like to say they're professionals. At the end of the day, they're there to play. They've played in every weather. I'm sure this is not Brock Purdy's first game in the rain. Unfortunately, he played like it was. And, you know, you see him wiping his butt cheek to get his hand dry. I didn't see Jordan Love doing that. Jordan Love was throwing some of the most beautiful passes i ever seen. One And I, I took some notes on this game. One thing I saw, second quarter, about 11 minutes. Brock Purdy was flinching under, the pre, under pressure. He literally, this play... I think it was third down. Jose, he literally, like, turns his head and throws it, like, to the opposite direction. And this was no Mahomey, no look. This was him flinching from a sack. There was, like, a couple things I seen. I was really studying Brock Purdy because if people are saying he's the real MVP, I need to see it. I'm not expecting him to run like, you know, Lamar Jackson or 
have an arm like Josh Allen or Mahomes, but I'm expecting him to consistently be productive. I've never seen a quarterback throw the ball and turn their head in the opposite direction accidentally because they were scared. And this ended up being like a, a throw that just hit the ground, like a lot of the screen passes in the first half. I mean, the second throw of the game, he almost throws a pick six. Um, it was it was insane. It was insane to see that he kind of – the pressure kind of got to him. I don't think it was the rain. I think it was the pressure of winning. I don't know if you guys remember in our last episode, I said – you know, Brock Purdy has more to prove this year in the sense that last year there was no pressure. He was the backup. He was the guy that I was like, oh, well, he's performing. But now, you know, given that he's been uh, a serious contender for MVP, you know, one of the best passers we've seen this year is more on the line. I think it was pressure because this was his first real experience of him being expected to win it all. I don't know if that makes sense. But, yeah, I just feel like, Jordan Love was was dishing out beautiful, you know, throws. It seemed like he was more poised. I think the common denominator we've seen this week in Jose is that going for it all, trying to win it in one throw, is not necessarily the smartest thing to do. Because Josh Allen, you know, him, you throw it up in the air like that, you're just asking for it to be intercepted. And we've seen that's how the game ended. I love the physicality of the Packers. I think that they were more physical than the 49ers, if that's something that can be measured. I think they were definitely more physical, and they got in the 49ers' heads, and a lot of tempers flared. I mean, the ref had to break up so many, you know, uh, personal fouls that offset each other. There's one thing that stood out to me. It looked like that was the Packers' game to lose when it should have been the 49ers to lose. So... Yeah, that's my take on it. That was a lot. What do you? What do you? What is your take on Brock Purdy's performance? Do you agree with my take on, you know, him kind of being under more pressure now than he was last year? And how would you rate Jordan Love's, you know, their their uh, competition in that game? Well, I, I like what, what you know your take here, Dan, because you really gave me a lot to uh, to sink my teeth into. As you were speaking, I was taking some notes too because I wanted to hit some certain points that you addressed. Um, to answer your question about Brock Purdy. You know, sometimes I have to take a step back, and we talk about culture and how the Niners have established themselves as a perennial playoff team. This is our fourth NFC title game in five years. We're supposed to be here, like you said, with the amount of talent, the arsenal that we have surrounded ourselves with and equipped ourselves with. We're supposed to be here, and we're supposed to play like we belong here. Um, but Brock Purdy, this is his you know second year as our quarterback, his first full season as our quarterback and granted as you mentioned he is a professional he's supposed to be here in his own right i think yeah i i think your take of this is now his team and he's a, he has a little bit more pressure on him i agree with this take because last year we're playing with house money essentially we don't really know what we have with brock we have a small sample size of what he's working with in terms of this offense that's why i think in hindsight this game played so well to to the Packers and Jordan Love because I look at Jordan Love and I see a lot of upside and I'm happy for the kid I'm happy that he was able to come in after an Aaron Rodgers and kind of forge his own his own idea of what this offense can become and I know Nick Bosa heading into this game had addressed that he said what with Aaron Rodgers this offense had a little bit more of of a freestyle to it Aaron Rodgers was able to come out of the pocket and really really freestyle the play if 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 the defense broke it down he was able to establish a new play in a sense and really play as if it was backyard football. But Jordan Love is able to feed into LaFleur's offense and have that structure and that design that they would ideally like. I think Jordan Love played this game the way Brock Purdy did last playoffs. There wasn't that much expectation. We didn't know what we had with them. But now that they're the, the quarterbacks, he didn't have as much pressure. As you mentioned, they weren't supposed to be here. They're not. This is their game to lose, so being able to play freely, I think, played into um, the Packers' favor. The Niners, as we mentioned, they're the number one seed. They're supposed to be here. They're supposed to be in the NFC Championship, and I feel like we fell into that game, essentially a trap game. That hey, we're the better team. We're supposed to beat them. Whereas the Packers are, you know, we're not even supposed to be here. We we barely made it in as the seventh seed. So I compare to Jordan Love, not necessarily to Brock Purdy, but 
their scenario, what they're playing in. And that's this is his coming out party. We now can give Jordan Love his credit. And I'll give him the credit. I, the Packers gave one hell of a game. They had me sweating. When Jared and I, when we watch these games, um, we're very known in this household to watch games like it's church. We don't really say a lot. That's why when you were texting us, we had a little group chat going on. We weren't really responding because we're locked in the game. <laughs> You know, to the point where, where Jared had placed the chat on, on Do Not Disturb because he's locked in. And me, I would I would text back maybe after every drive because I have to see the whole thing in its entirety to develop an opinion, to develop my take. Um, and when we watch games, he's animated. He's yelling at the screen. He's upset. And me, I'm sitting back and I'm taking it in. For this game, yeah. for this game, the roles were flipped. He was taking it in and I was the one that was like jumping up and was upset. <laughs> And, and for those who don't know, um, like Jared and I, we worked together. Dan, you worked with us for a little bit of time there. Jared yeah. was able to get the day off. He got coverage. I wasn't able to. I was at work. So I missed the first two drives of the game. I didn't see the opening possessions for either the Packers or the Niners. So here I am driving down you know, down the street trying to make it just to you know, catch the third drive if I'm lucky. And I did, you know, greatly enough. Um so I didn't get to see much of those opening drives. And you talked about the pick six. I think it's that argument of rest versus rust. We hadn't played a meaningful game in three weeks. And so it was expected on my end that we would kind of struggle against the Green Bay Packers. Because, I mean, you saw the performance they had the previous week against Dallas Cowboys where they, like yeah. you said, they completely walked them. They dominated them 27-0 to zero at half. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. It wasn't supposed to happen. So yeah. so we fell into that thinking again, we're really rested, we're ready, but we didn't have the reps. And they can say all they want that, oh, we practice hard, we prepared. But in-game football is way different than practicing on the field with your own teammates, and I think we both can attest to that. Yeah, when you're not, you know, I'm sure they're doing, you know, not tackling each other, just kind of padded practice, kind of look run through. A walkthrough would be a better thing than, to say practice because I guarantee they weren't you know full on trying to sack Brock Purdy it's all different when Mm -hmm. you got a 300 pound guy moving at a you know 4 3 40 at you it's it's a a lot different when you know you know in the comforts of practice nobody can probably touch Brock Purdy especially in the playoffs Mm -hmm. and and I wanted to touch I want real real quick I'm sorry Dan but like I I wanted to touch on on some of the things that we need to improve on because coming out of this game, I feel like this is the kind of game we needed. We needed a wake-up call. We needed to see that, hey, this is how quick it can all end before our very eyes. We can't take it for granted. We're in the playoffs. But there was that lack of discipline I saw. You mentioned Trent Williams. Trent Williams, as we know, was on the Washington Redskins, Washington Commanders um, for his whole career until he got to us. So he's not accustomed to being in the playoffs. He's now realizing that this might be his best chance to get a Super Bowl ring. And I'm not condoning his actions, but I can understand that frustration. And he needs to keep that in check because we're super close. We're one game, one win away from entering the Super Bowl. But one thing that I saw that was very concerning were the penalties. You look at the Green Bay Packers, they finished with only one penalty for a loss of five yards. Whereas on our end, we had six flags costing us 83 yards. Two of which were costly were, were costly past interference from Ambry Thomas, one of our cornerbacks, number twenty, who I immediately like was yelling at the screen, "What are you doing?" Like he's over here selling, because there was the second pass interference call. Jordan Love throws it deep, a beautiful ball, but I didn't I didn't see as if it was going to be catchable. The receiver would have had a hand on it, but you would be hard pressed to pull it down. And what does Ambry Thomas do? He wraps him up in the middle as the, as the ball's coming down. And I'm like, what the hell is he doing? He's wrapping him up. I'm surprised they didn't. Yeah. Like, they, they called the penalty at a reasonable time. I would have pulled the flag out the moment I saw his arm go around him because it was just that egregious. <laughs> that That's definitely something we need to improve on. My biggest thing is time of possession. And we were able yeah. to, we, we split it. It was 30 30 for the time of possession. We controlled the ball through the air, we had better passing yards than they did my biggest thing was just was the discipline you play like you belong there you play like you like you've been there before and those penalties really cost us and i'm hoping that moving forward as we face and prepare for the detroit lions who is an inexperienced team they don't they haven't been in the playoffs 
for how many years? They just got their second playoff win in almost 35 years. We ha- we yeah. own we own the experience. We have the veteran leadership. We've been to the Super Bowl. We have that culture set. So I'm hoping that we use this game as, okay, this is the baseline that we're working with. We know what we have to fix. Let's go handle our business. Let's go reestablish who we are as a team and what we've been known to. And finally, my final point, my final point, my biggest point of concern is the health of Debo Samuel because we see what that offense looks like when he's not on the floor. Oh my goodness. Oh, I completely forgot about that. And you see, and that's that's just a testament to how much you how many weapons you guys have. Debo, and I think this is all and you guys will probably disagree with me. Horrible play calling. He got the kickoff. First, like, there was no need for him to really return that. I mean, I, I think it was – I'm pretty sure he caught it in the deep in the end zone. There was no need for him to return that. He re- tries to return it. Then they run three straight plays towards him, you know, targeting him, him catching him, getting tackled twice. His cleat comes off. That's kind of like, you know, if anybody who believes in luck or bad luck, okay, like, let's let's sit him down for a couple of plays. His shoe just came off. Yeah, it's an omen. So, I mean – yeah, that's that. That is a sign that okay, we're we're going to this guy too much. When you have so much to work with, you got George Kittle, you got McCaffrey, you got IU. You know, you got options to work with, and it felt like there was like Debo, 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 and then now you don't have Debo. So it's it's it's, it's interesting. And then you know um, they had him come back, which was silly because he literally had to get he had to be taken off the field. So you bring a guy back just to take him out again. So essentially. He got taken out twice, right? That made no sense. I mean, if we're, especially at this point, I don't think, you know, people are thinking that the Packers are going to put up uh, really much of a fight this game. We don't have much, we know, oh, it's okay. You sit this game out, we'll have you for the next one. If I'm the 49ers, that should be my mindset is that, okay, Debo, you rest this game. And, you know, as soon as, you know, it was bothering him, you rest this game. We'll use you in the next one, or we'll use you in the bowl. They, the 49ers were playing like they had to have them on the field. Like, like this was now or nothing, which is concerning to me because, like you said, they're supposed to be there. Like, that's this is an expectation. This is just another step in their path to get to the Super Bowl. Would you agree? 100%. 100%. And so I just, I just don't feel like it, it was necessary to have Debo there at all times. I just didn't... It didn't make any sense. Essentially, they hurt themselves um, by having him there. And then bringing him back was definitely wasn't smart. If I've got to start a guy like that, or your shoulder hurts, yeah, you sit in a couple quarters. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about the play calling at first, but I do feel one thing, the strengths that I will say, will say about the 49ers is their ability to put pressure on quarterbacks. Now, Jordan Love, look, much more composed to me than Brock Purdy did. However, he only played like that, you know, because that's 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 his kind of play style is very calm in the in the in the pocket. However, another quarterback would be scrambling all around and trying to escape and, you know, forcing them to throw an interception, which, you know, Jordan Love ended up did throwing a pick. So um, you know, to 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 the 49ers testament they played some great pass rushing. Now, I don't know how this is going to bold against – and honestly, I I think that they should beat the Lions, but I said the same thing about them beating the Packers. I don't know how close this game is going to be. But, I mean, if you have that type of pressure on any quarterback, right off the bat you have the advantage that this quarterback needs to get the ball out of their hands, and you guys have a great secondary, which means – they're going to be looking for them to, to make that that fast pass that ends up being a pick. So I think you guys played great pass rushing defense. I mean, excellent. It it was like, you know, five guys around Jordan Love at all times. Would you agree? Yeah, no, and they constantly got the pressure. My only um, complaint was we didn't get any sacks. We were able to get, you know, the pressures, which is valuable in itself. But you got to come home. You got to go all the way and get that sack. And I feel like heading yeah. into this game against Detroit, I'm thinking that'll be something we'll be able to see. Jordan Love, I'm not going to call him Lamar Jackson, but let's be real. 
He's more mobile than a Jared Goff, who is more comfortable staying in the pocket. And when you have a stationary quarterback like that, I feel like we'll be able to get home a lot more often than, say, against a Jordan Love or a Lamar Jackson. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, 100%. It's going to be, to me, like, and, and, and this is a lot. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm a diehard Brady fan. I think Jordan Love has one of the craziest arms I've seen in my, you know, short time on this earth. I see Jordan Love as one of the best passers I have ever seen. And it's just that that poise in the pocket. Like I said, you guys had five guys on him at all times. Now, you weren't able to bring him down for one, but that's that's a testament to his ability and not to you guys' lack of ability. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think, you know, it's always going to be hard to sack a guy like Lamar Jackson, no matter how good your defense is, because obviously, you know, it's – they're rushing at him. He has all the angles. He can go any direction, not to mention get rid of the ball. So, I mean, you know, your your pass rushers are at, an, at a disadvantage from the get-go. Um, so, Jordan Love just played it perfectly. He would st- – oftentimes he would step through the middle or he – you know, I saw him rolling to his left, throwing it across his right side of his bot. Man, he was making some crazy throws. But I don't believe Jared Goff is, is Jordan Love. He's not. So, I mean – Jordan Love, I mean, Jared Goff was struggling uh, to throw spirals with eight seconds of time. I mean, he can't even throw a tight spiral. Uh, Fred Warner's picking that off. Mm. <laughs> he's getting picked off. He's getting sacked. He's not escaping. I, I, he got he got sacked a couple times in the Buccaneers game. So, yeah, it should be an easy walk in the park, like you said. I think this was one of the best things that, you, that happened to the 49ers, you know, it was embarrassing to me if I was an, a, a 49ers fan that the game was this close. Um, but it's a learning moment. we got to humble ourselves and be like, hey, we needed this so that we can know what we can improve on. Mm-hmm. Like you said, a wake-up call and be prepared for the next game. Because I do think Jordan Love, as far as quarterbacks go, till the Super Bowl, that was your hardest foe that you guys would face in the playoffs. Would you agree? As far as quarterbacks. Yeah, no, I would have to agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the most skilled quarterback that you guys would have to go against before the Super Bowl. I mean, obviously, Jalen Hurts getting bounced. But if I'm the 49ers, I'm not worried about Baker Mayfield. I'm not worried baked baked beans. I'm like, I'm not worried about him. I'm not worried about, you know, Jared Goff. I mean, I'm not, these are guys that I'm not thinking like, oh, we have the game plan. Like, you know, it's, you're just going to play it straight up. You know, like yeah. there's no special contain for Baker Mayfield. So, but Jordan Love, on the other hand, is an X factor where I'm like, okay, I got to think about this, this, and this. And it shows that they were considering him because they were throwing different rushing and different blitz packages at him that he handled, I would say, pretty well. So I feel like you guys took down the Giant in the playoffs which not a lot of people expected to be the giant, but ended up being one. And now it's going to be smooth sailing. Would you Would you agree with that? Or do you think that the, the Detroit Lions will be a tough foe? I think in terms of quarterbacks, I think you're, you're spot on. Given what was left in the playoffs, I, I, heading into it, my concerns with, were guys like Dak Prescott, who had an MVP caliber season, a Jalen Hurts, who presents that issue with the mobile, with the mobile quarterback and a Matthew Stafford who has that veteran experience. Those were the three guys I was looking at and thinking, okay, if we encounter these teams, they're going to give us problems. So when they got bounced in the first round, I'm thinking, okay, the stage is set. The path is cleared. This is our best opportunity to get back to the Super Bowl. We're facing a young quarterback in Jordan Love, and I'm thinking, okay, it's his first postseason. Maybe we should be able to contain him. But as you said, he was an X factor, able to make these these spectacular throws on the run under duress he impressed me i think he impressed the whole nation with his play not only against dallas but against the the niners now what we have to work with was was either baker or jared goff and for me personally that's that's best case scenario baker mayfield zero and three against the niners jared goff three and three and five in his last seven games against the niners currently on an 0-5 losing streak against us. Now, granted, it's a different team. This was when he was with the Rams. He's now with the Lions. I think our issue against the Lions is going to be the offense. They're ranked number five offensively. 
And if this is how we performed against the Packer team, who shouldn't have been there, the Lions are are a capable team. They're here for a reason. They won their division. They have a good defense. I won't say great because they have that bend but won't break a defense. If they can limit us on the run, that concerns me. But if you look at their defense during the passing game, it's not the best. So when we have guys like Ayuk, George Kittle, Jawan Jennings, who had a great comeback game against the Packers, and hopefully a healthy Debo, because as of right now, of this recording, we don't know his stance for the NFC Championship. He claims to be okay and ready to go, but you got to go through the, go through those testing, go through the imaging, and get the okay from the proper personnel. So I'm hoping he'll be playing. He's optimistic, but again, I would be too. If I'm in Debo's position, I'd say I'm okay too because I want to play in the NFC Championship. So we'll have to wait. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see for that diagnosis and prognosis from the medical professionals. Um, heading into Detroit, I like our odds. I, I think we should be favored. We're currently favored 6.5 over the Lions, which I expect us to cover. Um, and is this with or without Debo? Do you think he's doing, you guys are doing damage without Debo to the to the Lions? Or do you think he greatly helps your chance? Like, what is what is your stance, you know, now that you're, you're saying he's questionable? You know, we don't know what's going on with him. Let's say he doesn't, doesn't play, God forbid. Do you still think this should be you know, kind of played in you guys' favor? I think we should still win. I won't say it'll be, you know, decisively. Unfortunately, I think it might be close again, like how it was with the Packers, because with Debo, he adds another layer to the offense. He adds this level of unpredictability, whereas with Christian McCaffrey, you know he's going to run the ball. Yes, he can pass catch, but you know he's going to run the ball because he's just that damn good at it. You look at Brandon Ayuk, who has been our vertical threat all year, and then a George yeah. Kittle who can block, pass, catch, and even run if he has to. But with Debo, as soon as you see him hit that motion, you don't know what to expect. Is he going to get the handoff? Is he going to lead a block? Is he going to catch the ball? He's that exclamation point that's on that offense. When the Golden State Warriors had guys like Draymond Green, who really pisses me off nowadays, and a Stephen Curry, <laughs> and a Klay Thompson, that's, that's great firepower. But then when you add a Kevin Durant, it's just the cherry on top where it's like, okay, now how do we account for everybody? That's what Debo Samuel is. So I'm, again, I'm. Oh, so so you think he's Kevin Durant here? I think if we're talking in terms of his importance to the offense and their ability to produce points and move the ball, I think he puts us over the top. I love McCaffrey, and I think he was what we needed for the run game. But Debo, you D Daniel, you yourself thought he was a running back when he's a wide receiver. <laughs> That's the, look at that's how he can confuse the defense. He's given our our setup and given our scheme. I think ultimately, yeah. with or without Debo, we can beat the Lions. But Debo is the yeah. difference maker by how much. So you think so? Then that answers my question. With with him, you think your chance is greatly. It becomes that decisive win. Yes. Okay, I so do. you're going on the record that with Debo, decisive win. Yes. What what do you what does that look like on a spread? Like how many points do you think you guys won by Debo one hundred percent healthy? He's not holding anything back. Scans went through good. MRI good. You know what what are you thinking? Okay, I'm also taking into account narrative. I'm looking at how they perform with the Packers. I always take that into into consideration. Granted, people like to say, "Oh, one game at a time. We move on to the next one." No, we'd be lying if we didn't say we had a sour taste in our mouth. After last, after you know this last game against the Packers, I think we can agree on that. Yeah, I agree. Without a Debo Samuel, I can see us winning four points, six points. Like I'm thinking, it's that close, Daniel. Debo on the floor, Debo on the floor, minimum fourteen points. And I'm thinking, oh my wow, Dan. And I'm telling you right now, it's only close because in the fourth quarter, Detroit starts scoring again. That's insane. And and it's crazy, though, because you say that four points, six points without Debo. It's, I, it's I don't that think different. That, I don't think that plays into Brock's into Brock's hands. Um, if I'm Brock, right, I'm trying to earn my next contract. I don't want it to be close at all. I mean, because we've seen he doesn't – and listen, I'm going to pay my respects to Brock because at the end he pulled it together, made some beautiful plays, and got the job done. I do believe that George Kittle was the MVP of that game. He kept you guys into that game in that game 
I mean, he showed off a pass catching ability that I personally, as a casual, haven't seen. I remember asking you guys a long time ago, you and Jared, I was like, who is the best tight end? And you guys said, you know, people say it's Travis Kelsey, but George Kittle doesn't get the opportunities that Kelsey has. And I had yet to really see Kittle put on that that show. You know, me watching the full game, you know, not highlights of him producing like that. And, I mean, he went out there. He kept you guys in the game. Would you agree that he was your offensive MVP that game? I'm glad you add offensive because I could see two people on offense that really kept us in the game. One, obviously, being McCaffrey. But George Kittle's contributions, again, you can't be measured. You look at him, yeah. and, and his history has proven. Against the Packers, he's known to have these big games. You go back a couple years ago when Aaron Rodgers was still there, Kittle had a you know a career game. Like if you thought he was good in this game, go back to like twenty twenty one during that season where he had like a forty five plus touchdown and multiple receptions and was just making these catches and just owned the middle of the field. Offensively, I got to give it to McCaffrey and I got to give it to Kittle. Um, defensively, Greenlaw and Warner, Fred Warner, our our, our linebacker, line linebacker core. Yeah. I think is second to none. The only ones that I would put on a similar tier would be the Baltimore Ravens, who I think have a hell of a linebacker core themselves. Um, but, in ter- oh, man. but in terms of MVPs, yeah, but in terms of MVPs, those are the guys I would give it to. Um, which leads me to the play calling. You, you mentioned earlier, what we, we stepped away from the thing that makes us work. The best is the run game. We didn't really run the ball well in the first half. And then in the second half, you can see the shift where it's like, okay, we used McCaffrey more. And that's what we needed to do the whole game. We've proven, and, and there's a statistic out there, when McCaffrey runs the ball at least 20 times, we don't lose. We don't lose when he when he's when it's um over 20 plus um runs and attempts. When it's under 20, we're like three and five, I think. It was like three and five. When he runs nope. over 20 uh, 20 attempts, we don't lose. The run is what sets nope. us up. But postseason, do you want him having 20-plus carries? I mean, look look at the Bills and Chiefs. That was an ugly game. Everyone was getting injured because, you know, you're 20 games deep into the season with the new adding of an extra regular season game. You know, you got three playoff games before you can even get to the Super Bowl. I mean, man, that's just heavy hitting. You're essentially getting hit by a car 20 times. Would you agree that you're going to take at least one hit per game? And as a running back... You're gonna take every uh, a hard hit every time you run the ball. Mm-hmm. So I mean, McCaffrey is not the guy you want, you know, kind of taking those hits because we've seen that he's been injury prone. Would you agree that he's been an injury prone player? I wouldn't say injury prone, but he does get banged up. You see him on the he side. Gets, you see yeah, him on the sideline having to get massaged. Yeah, injury prone. I don't know, but yeah. like, but like you said, the more often that you run the ball. Yeah, you're going to be prone to get those hits. Every time you touch the ball, every time you see that ball, you're going to get hit. So I do agree with that take. That is a fair point. And so with 20 carries, I mean, man, that's a lot to put. And I think that's in in my small sample size, because I, I will always say this, I am a casual. What I noticed about the 49ers, and this is going positives, negatives, they are very, if it works, do it till it fucking falls off the wheels. I'm telling you. That Debo call was ridiculous. I mean, dude, they, you would have thought Debo was Randy Moss the way they had him in every single package. Like, mm-hmm. they had him in every play. Like, man, they just – they were like, we're going Debo. And that's why they went away from the run game because McCaffrey was catching those screen passes, and they were doing that for a while to get the first down. So, I mean, the 49ers are going to do something until it just doesn't work anymore. I believe they're trying to guard against him getting injured because if he runs 20 plus carries, right? And he's getting his first downs. We saw that he was the game changer in the fourth quarter that he kept the clock running and he kept you guys getting first downs. He was moving the chains. Would you agree with that? Yeah. That right there, had he been doing that the entire game, who knows if he has the same, not only production level, but, you know, being into playoff game, it's their 19th, 20th game. Man, that he could he could easily sustain an injury like Debo did in the first five plays. So I mean, you just want to be very careful with how you're using your assets. You have, I mean, they have, and I agree with you. They should have ran the ball more, but I do think twenty is a lot. That's uh, I think that's pushing it in postseason 
where it's essentially you don't really need to use all them use have them have all these carriers when you have other weapons um uh, and obviously one got taken away with Debo being injured but prior to that you have essentially you know IU Kittle Debo McCaffrey and if you want to count Brock himself as a weapon you got five dudes right there that you can rely on so if you're talking about 20 plus carries that not only takes away from you know a Kittle's game who yes he's a good run blocker but we saw how he shined when Brock threw him the ball correct yeah so I mean there's a lot of X factors that uh, that stat about you guys not losing with 20 carries that m- might be right but is it smart for him to take on the load of the entire offense you know for a game that essentially doesn't really matter well it matters that it's postseason but it's a game that you guys should have won like we're and this is hindsight going into it this is a game that you guys are expected to win so why you know have him give him his all I, let me break it down like this Jose um for those who don't know I'm an I'm a collegiate athlete my coach would always tell us he would say guys you can only dig two or three times a season and what that means is is when you give every single thing that you got you can only do that two or three times a season and then after that you either get injured or you don't produce you know your body just can't dig deep down you know, more than two or three times a season. And I run track and field and cross country. And I believe that holds true to a lot of different sports. That's why Webb and Yama is on a 25-minute restriction. His body isn't there yet for him to be able to dig on a nightly basis without him being injured. Christian McCaffrey doesn't need to dig on the first, you know, their first playoff game. That's not necessary. Um, I believe you save him for when you need him. You know, maybe next game or maybe the Super Bowl. You know, games that count. Having him run 20 carries against the Packers who weren't even supposed to be there. It seems like they made the right call doing that. Well, what is your take on that? Do you do you still – do you think that – the like, would you like to see him with 20-plus carries against the Lions? I hope it doesn't get to that. Um, I hear your point, and I'm, I want to do one final point because I do want to get to the Lions game after this. But okay. with with – the whole Christian McCaffrey. I hope it doesn't get to that point. I'm not saying we have to run him 20 times, but it's just that number is what popped up, and that's you know what's worked in the past. What I would have preferred is they would have established that run early. You establish that run early, and then the field opens up, and you're able to disperse the ball to your other weapons. To your point, I don't like that they were overly aggressive with Debo because, as we saw, he's now injured. He is, he's out with that shoulder. When you have an embarrassment of riches, or embarrassment of riches of other weaponry that you can use at your you know, disposal, why hone in on only one? You want to be able to keep the defense on their toes and spread the ball out, and now it's like, okay, where are they going to go? Um, I will give credit to Brock Purdy, though. We keep talking about how he underperformed in those first three quarters, but I think we can both agree when it mattered most in that fourth quarter, he did what he had to do. He had his first game-winning drive at in the postseason against a, against a really good Packer team. I will continue to give them their flowers, no matter how much I disagree with Kevin, who I work with at work and is a mad Packer fan. I th- <laughs> And, you know, he talked trash all week, dude. And it's like I, t- I would tell Jared, let him have his moment. They're not supposed to be here. They're not used to it. Let him have his fun because I was that confident in the Niners. Now, granted, yeah. it was closer than I would have liked it, but the better team won, in my opinion. Not to say the Packers aren't good. But I do think the more experienced and the better team found a way and they made the right plays and they won that game. To but is that a surprise to you? I mean, weren't you guys already going into it, the better team? Yeah, then that's why I said, like, you know, it shouldn't have been that close. So me being me, yeah. me being me, and you know me, I try to be respectful of everyone's opinions, even if they're wrong. And I say disrespectfully or respectfully, you know, I may disagree. I can't talk trash. I really can't because the Packers put us on the ropes. Like that was a wake up call, and I'm proud to say that we emerged victorious. But um, yeah, that that game in itself is not something to hang our hat on. I definitely think it's something to remember so we can establish a better run game against the Lions, who who yeah. performed really well against Tampa Bay. Uh, would you say that their story in itself is a surprise, or do you think the Lions have played up to their to their expectation or and are rightfully where they're supposed to be? 
I think it's a little bit of both. I think for anyone who is entering a level of greatness, at some point you have to be confident in your own abilities before others are confident in yours because that's all that matters. I mean, nobody was confident in Brock Purdy until Brock Purdy performed. Which I don't think in 49ers fans, when it came to that, that both quarterbacks got injured, you're like, oh, we're saved, Brock Purdy, you know? Like, were you thinking that? Seventh round guy? He's dropped in seventh round, right? Dan, yeah, he was he was the last pick. Seventh round, 262. I can tell you, like, vividly, the conversation Jared, my dad, and I had when we found out that we had lost Trey and Jimmy Garoppolo. When when we found out that they were done and we were we we just had Brock Purdy and he was the last pick in the draft, I'll be I'll be completely honest. I thought, oh my god, which free agent are we gonna have to sign? Because I didn't know that he was gonna end up being this good. And I I'm okay with saying I was wrong, but I was already looking at like, oh my god, like is a guy like Matt Ryan gonna come out of retirement because he played under the Shanahan offense at that <laughs> at that time. Cam Newton was like barely a free agent, so I'm like, dude, do are we gonna have to resort to Cam Newton? Like, I I was over here playing GM. Like, who are we gonna call to come out of retirement or come off the bench to help us out? And, and luckily, <laughs> RG three. Imagine, and again, he he played the Shanahan offense, so I was like, why not? Um, but I'm I'm happy to say I was wrong, and Brock Purdy proved us wrong, and he's playing out of his mind, and I'm happy he's on the team, and I'm looking forward to how he performs against Detroit. But but yeah, in that moment, I will. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't a hundred percent confident at first until we finally got to see him play. Exactly, and and that right there is a testament to his own confidence and his own ability. And I think you got to be crazy to be great, you know. So the Lions, you know, they're over here giving these pre speeches before the season starts about you know you can kick kick us down, and they sound crazy. But the confidence that he had in that group and in himself and in the people around him, it, it shows that, that they really believed what they were saying. Because anybody can believe anything. And, I, and I'm always going to use Tua because I really despise that nigga. But Tua goes in there and is talking about, oh, I'm only good with, with Tyreek. Oh, like trying to be sarcastic and stuff. Do you, it didn't really sound convincing that he believes that he's a top guy, you know? That didn't sound like a confident player because a confident player wouldn't even acknowledge the noise. You know, the confident player would just go out there and do it. People have been hating Lamar Jackson since he was drafted because he decided for his mom to be his agent. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't understand what's so wrong with that. Maybe it's not necessarily the traditional thing to do. I'm not too aware of his mom's abilities as far as legalese. I can't speak on that. Obviously, I'm sure she's not a lawyer, a lawyer probably does no more legal things than she does, or like, you know, an agent. But, hey, he's keeping it in the family. People hated him for seven years, and what did he do? He went out there and played. So, I mean, you got to be confident in yourself, and then it will reflect whether you truly believe it. So I do think the Lions deserve to be here. I don't think this was a fluke or an accident, but I also believe that, yes, they are confident. This is their confidence you know, showing it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of fairy tale, you know, but they made the fairy tale come true. They made those words in the book. You know what I'm saying? They, they wrote it. They were the author of their own story and they, they spoke themselves into existence and manifested a great season, which I don't think a lot of people were even thinking the lions were going to make the playoffs this year. Were you? Yeah, no, actually I had them penciled in as a, a, a divisional, not divisional wild card. excuse me. Yeah, so I mean, it's 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 interesting that they've gotten this far, but you know, um, I don't think this it was far fetched when you really look at what they have offensively. Um, so I mean, it's 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 going to be a, a good show, I believe, but I do think that the Forty ers have this one in the bag, and and you know, going to the AFC, how, what do you, what is your take on Mahomes versus Lamar Jackson? You know, MVP versus Super Bowl champ, former Super Bowl champ, previous Super Bowl champ. I feel like it feels like a, the Chiefs haven't won in a while, but they, they literally won it last year. What is your take on this 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 classic match that we're about to, to see? I mean, you talk about heavyweight fights like Lamar and, and, and Patrick Mahomes. It's two elite quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Granted, they're not the only ones on the field, but that's how they're going to market it. 
and I, I'll, to your point about Patrick Mahomes and it feels like he hasn't won in a bit, it's because it's the offensive struggles that they had throughout the regular season. But the biggest thing is this isn't the regular season. We're now in the postseason, and this is when the Stars come out and they perform. And I have to give credit to the Kansas City Chiefs because against the Bills, they look like the old Kansas City Chiefs. They look like those Chiefs that have been to the Super Bowl, that have been to the AFC Championship countless times. I look forward to it. I think ultimately that's the heavyweight fight that we all want to see, especially given how the Bills versus Chiefs went. And in comparison to how the Niners performed against the Packers, these are valuable games that a Patrick Mahomes or a Lamar Jackson um, needs in order to perfect their craft and become the best of the best en route to a Super Bowl. And I do believe in the old adage that iron sharpens iron. You want to play the best to prove that you are the best. I look forward to this game. I think it's going to be ultra competitive, just like how the Bills and Chiefs were. And I think I still am going to rock with the, the Ravens. I think they're a buzzsaw. I can't see anybody beating them with the exception of one team that resides in Santa Clara, but that's me being biased. I think Lamar Jackson is on a mission. <laughs> I think Lamar Jackson is on a mission to prove that he is that guy because he hasn't really had a signature moment in the playoffs. I think this is his opportunity to finally break through and get to a Super Bowl. Whether he wins or not, that's yet to be seen. But I do think that they're more equipped than a Buffalo Bills to to unseat the current reigning and defending Super Bowl champions. And I would 100% agree with this take. I mean, we've seen that he's just completely, you know, and I like that me and you are both narrative guys because I think the narrative matters. As an athlete myself and you as, you know, I know that you run on your own and work out on your own as well. There's the mental game of any physical activity is, 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 is important it's a, it's significant the narratives to me matter it's not just the numbers it's not just what happens on the field because if we're just going off numbers it should have been 100 0 with the 49ers and the packers i mean you guys should have well we know that didn't happen and it's it's the narratives and things that that play into how people perform i believe lamar jackson is just tired of everyone speaking on his name talking about how he can't throw, how he relies on his legs. When we, we we praise other quarterbacks for extending the play, we call it extending the play when it's a Russell Wilson, when it's an Aaron Rodgers, mm -hmm. you know, when it's a Josh Allen. And, a, and Josh Allen literally today, he looked like a running back. He went out there, his most valuable plays were him running. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, 100%. You mentioned his size and his poise. How are they going to stop him? Like, I, I don't blame him either. If I have that gift, that natural God-given talent to run over guys like that, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Exactly. And so, but when Lamar Jackson does it, it's, oh, you know, he doesn't have a good arm or he's looking to run. I don't think any quarterback is looking to run. If the play falls down and the pocket collapses, why would he take the sack? Or why would he throw it out of bounds when he can get yards? Um, and it, 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 to me, like you said, he's on a mission. This narrative, he did, it's a, it's something bigger than him this time. You know, this time around, he's not just the rookie or he's not just, you know, the scrambling guy. He's the MVP. You know, he's coming for to show that I deserve this MVP because I'm the absolute best. I think finally he has a great supporting cast. I love how you mentioned earlier that it is going to be Mahomes versus uh, Lamar Jackson however there's more people on the field it's a team game but you know the narrative is this is these are the two guys and then finally he has a supporting cast to actually have a complete team around him so I mean I think this is his best chance at a Super Bowl you know I have them beating the 49ers but I feel like it could go either way um, but this is his best chance to at least get there this is his best chance that he's had so far. And um, I do not I do believe the Chiefs are good. They're veterans, but they do not have the same team. They'll never have that same explosiveness that they had when they had Tyreek Hill and other weapons. So, I mean, uh, the Packers coach said it best. I believe it was the Packers coach in a post-game uh, conference. He said, we'll never have the same group again. And that is, is unbelievably true, that they'll never have that same group. Every year, 
you know, new guys sign, new guys retire, new guys leave, new guys get traded. Things change. So, I mean, the Chiefs that won it last year are not the Chiefs that won it this year or, or trying to win it this year. The Chiefs that won it last year is not the same that had Tyreek. So, um, it's 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 going to be interesting to see how they fare without all of their weapons. And you know, a couple guys got banged up in that Bills game, so it's a essentially a healthy Ravens versus an injured Chiefs. So I think it, this is Lamar Jackson's game to lose, and I have them winning by at least fourteen. Really? Yes. I, I don't. I don't know about fourteen. I could. If you gave me seven or ten, okay. But like a two touchdown score, I. Well, I mean, they struggled with Josh Allen, man. They struggled with containing a guy who, and and I was. I'm telling you, I got a lot of respect for Josh Allen, but it looked like he was just looking to. It looked like, you know, a lot of the plays, he kind of was overwhelmed with how many routes people were running and what I mean by is like there was a lot of crosses there was a lot of different coverages that um, the Chiefs were throwing at him which is why he felt uncomfortable to throw it to Diggs in that moment also Diggs being unproductive he just he ran a lot and I mean that was a guy who you know ran more than Lamar this year so Mm. imagine you know a guy who's actually throwing the ball like Lamar Jackson throwing as well as he is getting all these perfect passing ratings it opens up the field for him to do damage when they couldn't contain a guy who that's pretty much all he was doing this game. So, I mean, if they struggle with a Josh Allen, a Lamar Jackson who's much faster, much more elusive, and has thrown better this year, it's going to be some serious problems. Yeah, no, I think that's a good take in terms of how Josh Allen fares versus like a Lamar Jackson and their play style. Because one thing I will give credit to a Lamar Jackson is these last couple of years, he's really presented himself more as not a quarterback that can run, but that a quarterback that if need to, he can run. Like he's really been poised in the pocket and really developed himself as a better passer, more of a, of a pass first option rather than, okay, I'm going to run out of here and, and get some yards myself. That discipline yeah. that he has to have that mentality of, I'm going to throw the ball. If there's, if my reads aren't there, okay, then I'll have to run it. But I will give him credit for that, that, that sense of discipline and really establishing his own ability to pass the ball rather than run it the way he has. Because I, I agree with you, there has been a level of disrespect with him that he's just known for scrambling. Well, he's not. Not anymore, at least. He's really developed his game, matured his game, and I think ultimately this game is going to come down to the offenses. We saw how Kansas City was able to produce these points in dire drives where they had to compete with Buffalo. Uh, to compete with Buffalo, I just don't think it's going to be enough to combat with the Ravens. The way that their their offense is, is firing right now on all cylinders and the offensive weaponry that they're working with, especially with a guy like Likely, who is having a great season. And on top of that, Mark Andrews is coming back. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure he's coming back for this game. But he's been in practice. He's been projected to come back at point in this playoffs. Now, whether he presents himself as a big-time player, that's yet to be seen. But having reinforcements like a Mark Andrews will only bode well for the Baltimore Ravens, which, again, I agree with you. I think they're going to win. 14 points I thought was a lot. But given how they performed against like the Houston Texans and how you mentioned the Chiefs struggled with the Bills, maybe it's not too much of a a far-fetched idea. And who? And I'll put it like this: I'll say, who would you rather see in the Super Bowl? Would you rather see the Ravens? Like, what for for the Forty ers sake? Would you rather see the Ravens or would you rather see the Chiefs? That's that's an interesting point because I talked about this with Jared. That you know, I'm not going to look past the Lions. I'm going to give them their respect. But let's let's say, let, let's. <laughs> I'm looking past the Lions. No, no, no I'm not going to do that because I'm not falling <laughs> into that game. Um, I'll give them their respect. Like you said, they're here for a reason, but. Let's say we get past Detroit, which I think we can. No matter who wins the FC Championship, it's a revenge game for the Niners for the Super Bowl in, in you know Super Bowl Forty Seven or Super Bowl Fifty Four, because both of those teams have beaten the Niners. Granted, yeah. um, to answer your question, I want to see a little bit of new blood. I'll go with Lamar, especially because of how the Christmas game went down. I feel like we're able to adjust and prepare for what we've seen against them. Grant and given that we've played them. Um, 
I would I would like to see the Ravens because I don't want to see Mahomes and Taylor Swift and you know all of that in the Super Bowl. I'm okay <laughs> with that. You don't want to see Jason Kelsey with the shirt off in the press box. I would much prefer yeah. to see Jason Kelsey in the pre- in the press box rather than a Taylor Swift. <laughs> so I, I take it you're not a Swifty then. I am not. I'm not. I and it's, I, I, I and it's like I'm not disparaging people who like her. That's fine. That's your prerogative, but I don't see it. I really don't. You know that's and that's a lie. You know what? One of my favorite songs of hers is mm-hmm. "Bad Blood," only because Kendrick Lamar is in it. <laughs> like that's literally the only song I can honestly say I've listened to the whole way, is because Kendrick okay. Lamar is on it. Well, can you can you complete this 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 lyric? I wear t-shirts. Okay, that's not fair. Everyone knows that one. See, uh, you might be a Swifty. No, that, that's not the same thing. Swifty. That's not the same thing. They play that song all the time, and I said I haven't heard the whole song, but I mean, yeah, like we've heard that line. Hey, is that a classic? I think that's a classic, man. I'm going to go down on the record. That is a Swifty classic. I mean, if you're a Swifty, I guess. I mean... Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, hey, we say we're not Swifties, but you... What do you know? What the other person is wearing in this lyric? Yes. Uh, okay, she, 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 so you she, might be a Swifty. She's she uh, captain, re- and I'm on so the bleachers. Maybe... <laughs> no, but you know, to your point, I do want to see Lamar Jackson and and the Ravens. In I mean, Lamar Jackson, the Ravens versus the Niners in the Super Bowl. However, I think for you guys' sake. You would rather see the Ravens because you see the Chiefs. The Chiefs are too comfortable with being in the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, I'm just talking about from a competitive standpoint. Like, you guys have obviously have the confidence that you want to beat anyone. But I want to play the least experienced person. Yeah. Lamar Jackson, you know, and to me, not to his fault, because we talk about bad organizations. The Ravens have always historically had, like, horrible receiving cores. It's just, like, always been a defensive-minded success. Um, but that being said, he hasn't had any playoff success. So him getting to the Super Bowl would be a first, whereas the 49ers have been there before. You know, like, the, these guys are used to having that chip on their shoulder that we're going to the Super Bowl. Um, with The Chiefs would also have that same mindset – and they've beaten you guys. So it's like that being they, – they would just be too comfortable to where, as a 49ers fan, I would rather see – let me get the rookie here, which Lamar Jackson isn't a rookie, but he would be a rookie in the Super Bowl position. Let me get the rookie. Let me get the ex, inexperienced young team. Let me get the first-timers. I don't want the people that beat us. Yeah. You know, because you said, yeah, the Ravens beat you, but it wasn't the same Ravens. You know, we're talking about – basically two decades ago a decade ago yep. so i mean i'd rather not see you know they just broke brady and gronk's record so they're on a roll here they got the rhythm travis kelsey and mahomes have now the most i believe the most uh connecting touchdowns in history uh yeah they actually passed your guys too I joe know. montana and jerry rice i know so um i mean that's just me do you agree with that no, I think that's a valid point. Um, selfishly, I, I part of me would want to see the you know Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, just because as you mentioned that incarnation of the team beat us. Like you said, the Ravens. It was a different team. It was a decade ago. Um, yeah. But you can't discount the importance of experience, and like you said, for a guy like Lamar Jackson who has yet to lose his Super Bowl virginity, he is he hasn't been there. So I would like that's a valid point. I would rather much take the inexperienced team, but to that point, you could even argue they're hungrier than the Chiefs. Do you want to face a more desperate team or a team that maybe can become a little bit more lack- lackadaisical? Because they've been there, they've been, they've done that. I think it go, mm. I, I think it go either way. Mm, that's a valid point. Yeah, I mean, with these narratives, you can you can go you know over and over for different things, but I mean, they show today where they could have been lackadaisical because they, they were their team who's been there before. You yeah. know, Patrick Mahomes has beat, you know, uh, Josh Allen before. This isn't something new to him. But they show that you could tell there's just the difference in just being there, being in the moment and, and seizing the moment. Patrick Mahomes was ready. You know what I mean? 
He was ready for the moment. They marched down the field at will. Um, Travis Kelsey had a slow... Now, that's something concerning that we need to talk about. Travis Kelsey has these slow-ass starts to the game where it's like the first quarter, he's non-existent. He doesn't establish his game. And that's why I believe it'll be a four, uh, a 14-point lead by the Ravens because, shit, if he doesn't already... if If he's not in the game by then... I believe he's just going to keep going. Like, I believe that Lamar Jackson is going to keep putting points on the board while Travis Kelsey is trying to establish his first touchdown of the game. And they can't ha- that can't happen because other than Pacheco, who does Mahomes have? Yeah. No, valid. valid. And I think that's another testament to how their offensive struggles have been a focal point of the NFL. And, there's, and the NFL's storyline throughout the season is, yeah, there's that lack of um, productivity on the offensive side. I think they sorely miss a guy like Tyreek Hill, who certainly opened up the field, you know, by a wide margin. You know, you could, you can argue. No, I don't even think it's an argument. You could, that he was like their best player, even if they had Travis Kelsey. The level of impact that Hill had by opening up the field, you could throw a bomb to him on any drive, and he's running away with it. And so, when you're sorely yep. missing someone like that, when your best players are, you know, Kelsey and a Pacheco, and other than that, it's like, yeah, who else is there? Yeah, yep, yep, and I agree. I agree with that. I agree that Tyreek definitely opened up the field for Travis, kind of made him a a better player than what he, you know, I don't want to say actually is, but definitely helped him be in single coverage. But now with him not being in single coverage, we've just seen he just he has these slow starts. I'm like, man, like, you know, what it? He's in all these commercials and you know all these people's now Rushmores and. I mean, you you could even dude, argue, I, you can even argue that after the departure of a Tyree kill, Kelsey hasn't really had the same productivity because, like you said, there's it doesn't open up as much now. Defenses are able to hone in on a Kelsey more so. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and I think, man, I think as we also, what is your take on? And I've always thought about this. What is your take on players having podcasts? I mean, especially postseason. What is your take on that? Is it, is it a bad, like, positive thing, or do you have a negative kind of outlook on that? Like, do you, to me, I think players should be 100% locked in. Yeah. I think Travis Kelsey has so much noise around him, which is why I think I'm very critical of him. Obviously, we talked about the Swifty Nation. I mean, they showed Taylor Swift in the Bills game, like, 30 times, and it was the same cut of her smiling. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't even anything new. She was just smiling and looking out of the window. But, I mean, there's so much noise around Travis Kelsey on and off the field. And then, of course, he has the podcast with his brother. Do you think that he's getting away from the simple fact that he's playing the game of football? I That's, that's a really interesting point because I can speak as a Niner fan. We have, you know, Fred Warner has his own podcast as well. And I think it just depends on how they approach it. I look at it this way. Mm. Fred Warner, when he has his podcast... He keeps it in-house. He talks about himself. He talks about the Niners and how they're doing and how they're preparing without having to, you know, exploit too much. But still, it's kind of like a a come together. He does it with his wife and they're able to talk about life. And he also happens to be a Niner, a Niner player. You know what I mean? Like it's not central around it, but it is an aspect of that podcast. Whereas a guy like a Micah Parsons was on his podcast criticizing other teams and I know it's natural you know obviously we're going to talk about what's going on in the NFL but he's over here writing checks that his ass can't cash because you look at (laughs) you look back when we beat the the Cowboys and he was saying you know best believe we see them again it's going to be different well they got bounced in the first round when we were waiting for them instead we had to face the guys that beat them so I think it depends on how you approach it I, what I will say, and I feel like it's a, sim- a similarity with social media, and this is why I give credit to, Le- to LeBron James. He has his social media, but when the playoff starts, he deactivates it and he locks in, and I like that. You can have it during the regular season and use it sporadically because it's human nature. Obviously, we want to connect with people outside, but when it's the playoffs, now we're locked in. Now you have to adjust. <clears throat> Yeah, and that's then and and again. I'll speak as a Niner fan. That's what Fred Warner did. Fred Warner has his podcast with his wife. His last episode was of the last you know week of the regular season, and now going forward, they're pausing. They're taking a break from it. 
which I think is the way to go. Exactly. Exactly. You hit it. I couldn't have said it any better. Any better. And to your point, Travis Kelsey does talk about other players in the league, which I think, like, I mean, man, you gotta you gotta focus on yourself. You gotta focus on your team. You can't be, you know, an athlete going over other athletes and and still say that you're focused on the game because you're focused on their game and you're not necessarily playing them. You gotta play your game. And I feel like that probably happened to Jason Kelsey. You know, I know the Eagles fell apart collectively, but it didn't help that he had his podcast. You know, so, I mean, focus. If you guys are losing to the Cardinals, I, the podcast got to go on a Fred Warner pause, a Fred Warner hiatus. Let's call these these athlete podcast pauses a Fred mm-hmm. Warner hiatus. You need to go on a hiatus. You just lost to the Redbirds. I mean, man. You gotta, you gotta do something different. If something keeps happening, you guys keep losing towards the end. You're the problem. You know what I mean? So, um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. Draymond Green calls it the new media. Mm-hmm. I'm not liking the new media. I don't like that the players are having these podcasts and, um, you know, especially in the postseason. Postseason, come on, man, shut it off and lock in for four weeks because essentially the playoffs is like four weeks a month or so yeah so i mean for one month you can't you know not go on a microphone and talk about other things that don't pertain to what you're you know doing i think you need to have a mind that's just solely on winning locked in on winning in your game plan and your practices and diet and resting i imagine their podcast takes a lot of time a lot of editing you know a lot of uh just a lot of scripting you know what i mean so i it takes a lot i mean like we put a lot you put a lot into this podcast i can imagine you know what they put in theirs as well so i mean you can only do so much and i think you should be focused on the task at hand which is playing football yeah no and i think that's 100 percent right and i'm glad that we hit that that note as we close the episode on this whole new media because I, I like the fact that they're able to open up and have this kind of connection with uh, with the fans. We want we, we as consumers like to get behind the scenes and know what's going through the thoughts of the athletes, of these competitors throughout the course of a season. But if I'm in their position, I'm trying to be responsible not only for my own sake, but to the team's sake. Because ultimately, the goal is to win. And if you see that this might be taking away from the team's productivity... Like you said, maybe it's time to take a hiatus, to take a step back. And if you want to use it for other reasons, like I mentioned, like how Fred Warner, his wife, do it and talk about other things outside of the season, I can respect that. But like you said, is it taking away from my productivity? Is it taking away from my livelihood? Because ultimately, it's like, which one am I want to do it? Which one do I want to do? There's money to be made with the new medium. But at the same time, if, I, if I'm an all pro linebacker for a perennial playoff team, that has a shelf life. You look at other stars who have stepped away from the leagues or stepped away from sports, you only have a certain amount of time at your peak in the NFL, in the NBA. That's why you see yeah. guys when they retire, then they go through that media, then they become a member of the new media, as Draymond likes to say. You know? Yeah, and I, and I like that. I agree with that, man. That's an that excellent take. Because definitely, you only have so much time to be great, everyone. So when you go to work this week and you're listening to the J Area podcast, just know that that you know that day could be your last, and you could you you know it could be your best day or worst day. But you only have that moment to make the most of what happens every day. So you got to go out there, be your best, live your best, do your best. That's all you can do. One hundred percent. I look forward to see how the NFC and AFC championships roll out. Hopefully, the uh, Niners will still be alive. I have my faith in them. I look forward to talking about that with you, Dan. Thank you again for joining me on the J Area Podcast. Thank you for having me, man. All right. We look forward to next week. We'll see you guys then. This has been the J Area Podcast. Peace out, everyone. (laughs) 